hemlock or other conifers. They all are technically edible. We're sort of talking survival food here. It's not something I would give to the guests for a company dinner. But if you were in a lost in the woods scenario, the, the needles are extremely high in vitamin C. You can chew on them and then just spit out the fibery part and you would be getting a dose of vitamin C. And there, the inner bark, so not the papery outer stuff, but just below the papery outer stuff, is also edible and very nutritious and even has protein. It tastes god awful, I've tried it. Um, but if you really, really, really were starving in the woods, you could do your pint. Better, for my money, is to make a really strong tea out of the needles and take a bath in that which is wonderful and it's a great muscle relaxer and it opens up the respiratory system and it's a more interesting use for the pine needles than trying to actually eat them, but you can. We don't have the kind of pine cones here that make pine nuts. Right? In the US, those only grow out west. Right? In Europe, they grow all over Italy and, and places, but that it's a specific variety, so you could drive yourself crazy collecting pine cones and hoping to find pine nuts. You're not going to. all over the city. It's an annual, so it dies back at the end of the year, but it'll be going until frost. I'm going to pass it around and most people are going to wrinkle their noses and go, yuck, why would you ever want to eat that when you smell it? Because it, it's a little like turpentine smell when you smell it straight up, but you don't use it that way. It's a seasoning, not a vegetable, and it's the seasoning that Mexican cooks use with their bean dishes as very subtly, like you would use a bay leaf, like one leaf in a pot of beans. You can use, the, you can use, the, these are actually the flowers. Um, you can use the flowers too, but it's the leaves mostly. So just a tiny little bit in the background and as a subtle background taste, not what you're about to smell. It's delicious. It's also the difference between if you've ever tried to duplicate what you had at the Mexican restaurant with your refried beans or something and it didn't taste quite the same. This is what you were missing because this would have been in there. Additionally, this is supposed to help prevent gas which if you're talking about bean dishes, it's useful for something. <laughs> okay. But you'll see as I pass it around to just smell it raw and straight up. It's used usually dried, but you can do fresh as well. It's it's intense. <laughs> so you would use the actual leaves, like one of the leaves? One leaf in like a pot of beans. And you like just a put it in like a raw leaf. Now, these um, will never get sweet. They stay nice and sour. They get a little sweeter after a frost, but not much. But what they are great for is doing jellies, jams, anything like that. Crab apple wine is great. And these were actually well, the bigger ones a little bit than this, but you can do it with this. This is what hard cider was made out of. And I don't know if anyone here read um, Pollen's The Botany of Desire. Mm -hmm. Johnny Appleseed, the story that they told me in school is not what actually happened. All right, he was not generously reforesting the world with apple trees, he was basically increasing the value of property. He would come from the east out west, buy a property, plant a lot of sour, deliberately sour apple trees because that was preferred for hard cider and hard cider was like the alcohol of choice at the time because we didn't have a lot of vineyards going. Then he'd come back east and say, property with already five year old established trees, you know, but and he'd sell it at a very high price and he died a very wealthy man. Um, so that was, the, but anyway, the crab apples and the sour apples were the preferred fruit, not the sweet ones, because they ferment easier and you end up with kind of a brighter thing. You can make the really, if you've ever taken apple cider, like from the farmer's market, the sweet stuff, and just let it sit out at room temperature for a little while and it starts to ferment yeah. and get busy, you can completely run these through a juicer and do the same thing. Make your own yeah, hard cider. My cousin did. Again, these are daylilies, mm -hmm. and you can see where the old flower stalks are here. Um, in the summer, these are blooming with those nice orange flowers that only open for one day. You can do the petals raw or dried. They're lovely on salads and things like that. You can do the unopened flower buds. You can cook them like green beans or pickle them. The hallmark to this, this is not, the name is confusing to some people. We're not talking about tiger lilies and Easter lilies and those kind of things. If you look at this flower stalk, there are no leaves on it. The flower would have been up here, right? 
if you think about the ones you get from the florist shop, which are usually the Asian leaves, they have lots of little spiky leaves all the way up to the flowers. Those are not edible. So one thing that you're looking for is a bare flower stalk. All right, and then the leaves are totally different from these long strappy leaves, not little short pointy ones. At this time of year, if you dig these up, the plant has formed little tubers that look sort of like fingerling potatoes, and that's exactly what you do with them. Scrub them up, you don't have to peel them and cook them any way you would a potato. Um, I think digging at this particular spot in the park might not be the best idea in the world, um, but <laughs> also anybody you know who gardens or lives in the country because they're roadside plants, at some point you have to divide these. They start to just take over and, and bunch up. When you divide them, just take off the little tubers, replant the root part, and the plant will be fine. So you can harvest these without killing the plant, even though it's the end.